Tonight on Currents News, a New York crackdown is coming just in time for the warriors who kept America safe. Fireworks and shootings across the city are keeping New Yorkers up at night. But for our veterans, it can mean something much more serious. I'm Jessica East Hope, and that's ahead. Rayshard Brooks is laid to rest today at the Atlanta church where Martin Luther King was pastor. An attack on a monument to a past president has the current one hopping mad. New York City is coming out of lockdown, but one woman tells me she has no plans of leaving her home. She's taken a vow. I'm Michelle Powers. I'll have that story you won't see anywhere else. Plus, Mexico is being ravaged by the COVID crisis. The numbers are startling. The news starts right now. Good evening, I'm Christine Persichetti. New York City is cracking down on illegal fireworks with an undercover sting operation. Thousands of complaints are flooding into the Big Apple's 911 and 311 phone lines about the increasing number of neighborhood explosions. Now, Mayor Bill de Blasio is vowing action. We're going to start a huge sting operation to go and get these illegal fireworks at the base, meaning everywhere they're being sold around New York City and even where they're being sold in surrounding states that we know are flowing into New York City. Fireworks are illegal to buy, sell or ignite in New York. De Blasio is saying the city is going after the sellers since not much can be done when someone shoots off a firework and disappears before cops arrive. <laughs> The mayor's fireworks crackdown is coming after a noisy street demonstration outside his Gracie Mansion home. Scores of drivers honked their car horns last night. The protesters complaining the fireworks are keeping them awake. City Councilman Keim Deitch saying, if we can't sleep, Mr. Mayor, you won't sleep. The car horn honking ended without arrests. The fireworks and the growing number of gunshots crackling throughout the night are leaving New Yorkers restless. But for our vets, it's something a lot worse. Currents News' Jessica Easthope has the story from Bay Ridge. I don't always jump. Uh, generally, I would probably say probably 80% of the time I do, but I always look. Bill Miller isn't describing enemy fire during his days in combat in Vietnam. He's describing what it's like when he hears fireworks. To be walking around, maybe going for a walk down along Shore Road at night, and, and, and fireworks are going off on a side street somewhere, it's very unnerving. Bill and other combat veterans have felt that unnerving feeling most nights this month. In Brooklyn alone, more than 4,500 complaints have been made to 311 this month. That's 80 times the amount of calls received by the city in the first six months of 2019. In addition, there have been more than 125 shooting incidents in June, numbers not seen in more than two decades. But for Bill, he says the fireworks are different because they can happen anywhere. While many associate the loud and colorful displays with celebration, for combat veterans, the sound and smells fireworks leave behind can trigger flashbacks associated with post-traumatic stress disorder. When you slept and all of a sudden there was a rocket attack, and that's what the fireworks is like. And basically, whenever we got a rocket attack, you always ran for cover. So that instinct stays with you. Bill says for combat veterans, the sound of fireworks can be mentally and physically exhausting. To run at heightened survival levels like that all the time is hard on them mentally and believe it or not, it's hard on them physically because you're always, you're always, your muscles are tight. There might be an end in sight for veterans like Bill with Tuesday's announcement by Mayor de Blasio on a major crackdown on illegal fireworks and the formation of a task force involving the Sheriff's Office, NYPD, and FDNY. This is a beginning. There's a lot to do, and we have to do it quickly. In Bay Ridge, Jessica Easthope, Currents News. The funeral service for Rayshard Brooks at Atlanta's Ebenezer Baptist Church was held today. Brooks died on June 12th after being shot by a former city police officer. Martin Luther King was the co-pastor of the church until his assassination in 1968. Darrell Forges is in Atlanta with more on today's service. At a holy place that's held hope, 
where Martin Luther King Jr. urged the congregation to never let go of a dream. Friends and family said farewell to a 27-year-old father at Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta. I look at my grandbaby right there. She's look, she looks just like him. And when I look at her, I know that he's not gone. Put your hands your back. Rayshard Brooks died on June 12th after being shot by an Atlanta police officer following an altercation in a Wendy's parking lot. An officer who shot Brooks has since been charged with murder. But here, the focus isn't on Brooks' death, but on his life. He radiated such a bright light that regardless of the cowardly act that took his life, his light will never be dimmed. He will continue to shine so bright, even in his absence. The eyes of the present now turn toward the future, a continued hope for change. Don't you stop until black lives matter in every state, in every city, in every hamlet, in every village, in every sector of American society, and ultimately the world. Daryl Forges, Currents News. President Trump is vowing today to put people in jail for a long time after an attempt to knock down a statue of Andrew Jackson. Protesters tied ropes to the Jackson statue in Washington's Lafayette Square Monday night across from the White House gates. Police stopped the toppling of the monument and made arrests. This morning, Trump said he wanted long jail terms. We are looking at long-term jail sentences for these vandals and these hoodlums and these anarchists and agitators. Trump called the Jackson protesters bad people, and he declared he wouldn't let them take down any monuments. The polls in New York City are still open at this hour as voters make their choices in primary elections. Some big name House Democrats are facing challenges at the ballot box. Congressman Elliot Engel in New York's 16th district is trying to fend off progressive candidate Jamal Bowman, a school principal. Congressman Gerald Nadler in New York's 10th district is being opposed by multiple challengers. The polls are open until 9 p.m. Europe is considering a travel ban against Americans once their borders open up next week. European Union officials are reportedly prepared to block U.S. citizens from entering the bloc because America has failed to control the COVID crisis. The EU countries are rushing to revive their economies by reopening borders on July 1st after months of lockdowns. If American visitors are kept out, they'd be lumped in the same boat with Russians and Brazilians called too risky for spreading the virus. On Capitol Hill this afternoon, Dr. Anthony Fauci testifying to Congress on how the country is coping with the COVID crisis. He's saying it's a mixed bag. It's a serious situation. In some respects, we've done very well. Right now, for example, the New York metropolitan area, which has been hit extraordinarily hard, has done very well in bringing the cases down. Fauci said the bottom line is with over 120,000 deaths and two and a half million infections nationwide, the crisis is not over and the guidelines about masks and distancing must be followed. The Big Apple is in the midst of its broadest reopening yet. New Yorkers can now go back to work, but many aren't. Currents News Michelle Powers introduces us to one woman who says she has no plans to leave her home. She's taken a vow. New York City is reopening, but one woman is choosing to remain in quarantine for the rest of her life. The enclosure was some kind of a draw that I can't really explain. The governor's stay-at-home order has nothing to do with it. It hasn't been only 100 days. Now, and at the hour of our death. For her, it's been decades. Took one last trip to Jones Beach and said, I will never be here again. And in fact, I have never been there again. Sister Susan Marie is a cloistered nun, and her confinement mirrors Americans today. Just outside these 20-foot walls is the heart of the pandemic, Brooklyn, New York, where people only leave their homes for necessities. But the outside world isn't something she misses. It's just something she remembers. There was a time when the superior in my early days sent me out for something. I don't remember what it was, but I had to go down 86th Street and I passed a pizza parlor, a hair salon, and I remember saying, oh, I haven't smelled that in a long time. Oh, I haven't smelled that in a long time. So there was some kind of a nostalgia happening. Her order, the visitation of the Holy Mary, have been living apart from the secular world since the 17th century. 
She joined the order in Bay Ridge when she was 36, having already lived a life working for years at NBC. Said little goodbyes along the way to certain kinds of activities. But the life Sister Susan Marie left behind outside these walls doesn't compare, she says, to what she found inside. They follow a strict routine each day, rising early to pray, work, meditate. They share a meal and silence together. Silence is very, very nourishing because in the silence, the Lord does speak. Silence, not something found by many Americans in the last three months. Right now, a perfect storm of civil unrest brewing, fueled by George Floyd's death at the hands of police, racism, the coronavirus crisis, and massive unemployment. Hail Mary, full of grace. But Sister says the conditions don't have to be perfect to hear God. But you can express that anger to God, too. He's going to hear it. Sister Susan Marie said something mystical is happening right now. The whole world, every person almost, you might say, is united, truly united on the same cross of Christ right now. Perhaps then, she says, we are locked in, but not locked out. In Bay Ridge, Michelle Powers, Currents News. There's a lot more news headed your way. There's been a lot of discussion lately about racism in America. That conversation could impact how we're viewed by other countries. A foreign policy expert is coming up. And the epicenter of the pandemic has moved from New York to Latin America. We'll show you which country is being hit hard. Stay with us. Now you can help us put your faith in the news. The next time you capture a newsworthy event, send us your pictures or video. It's easy. Go to netny.tv slash send us and you may see your submission on Currents News. Demands to stamp out the sin of racism are growing louder in the U.S. as social unrest expands from coast to coast in the wake of the deaths of Rayshard Brooks, George Floyd, and others. And what happens here can affect our relationships with other countries worldwide. Here to talk about that is Professor Travis Atkins from Georgetown University's Walsh School of Foreign Service. And Professor, so what kind of impact does racial injustice here in America have on our dealings with countries around the world? Well, as you can imagine, um, there is a gap for all of us between who we want to be uh, and who we actually are. And so for the United States that has positioned itself as a world leader in democratic governance, um, as a paragon of kind of human rights and human dignity, we have a very serious challenge promoting those ideals around the world, pressuring um, other governments to abide by those kind of international standards if they can look on the TV on a nightly basis uh, and see that we ourselves are not doing that. And so when they see tanks being rolled out and militarized police forces and tear gas and batons and helicopters being put upon peaceful protesters uh, in the American context, you can imagine that our kind of moral uh, and tough love kinds of lecturing overseas will ring quite a bit more hollow. So have the recent deaths of George Floyd, Rayshard Brooks, others, and the protests, and, and then the policing reforms that followed, has that changed how other countries view us? You know, what more can our diplomats and foreign policy leaders do? Well, I think that what we have to realize is that there is a direct connection between our domestic and our foreign policy. And so many of us uh, delude ourselves that these things are separate. Um, but in the piece that I recently wrote for foreign policy, uh, I mentioned a quote from the African-American novelist James Baldwin, where he says, I can't believe what you say because I see what you do. And so one of the biggest things we can do to strengthen our uh, stance and our reputation uh, in the world is to actually abide by the uh, ideals that we uphold here at home. Now, what about racism that happens in other countries? I mean, if you think about religious persecution, that's a problem in other areas of the world. Yeah, absolutely. We have no monopoly uh, on those things. And I think that that is kind of widely understood. But what we have been saying abroad is that we are an example of how you can overcome those challenges. And so when you look at the promises 
of our Constitution, when you look at the validity of the American social contract, there is always this notional belief that we have a system that will allow us over time to conquer uh, these kinds of societal ills. But I think that one of the problems that we have is that when it comes to the African-American community specifically, this uh, problem is so enduring, it's so longstanding, it's so uh, filled with brutality uh, and repression that it becomes very difficult to just sweep it under the rug as a bygone um, issue. What kind of impact does President Trump's remarks have on foreign policy, particularly when it comes to the coronavirus? The president calls it the Chinese virus, and at his Tulsa campaign rally, he actually called it Kung Flu. Your thoughts on that? Well, these are the kinds of things that, again, give our diplomats a huge challenge abroad. And so, as we know, all of our ambassadors all over the world are representatives of our government, but specifically representatives of the messaging and policies of the current administration. Uh, so you can imagine the challenge they have with things like Kung Flu, with things like the Chinese virus. Um, all it does is make an already difficult job that much more difficult. Administration's done. All right, Professor Travis Atkins from Georgetown University, thanks so much for joining us and sharing your thoughts. Thank you for having me. A parish dedicated to the specific needs of black Catholics is being established in the Diocese of Pittsburgh. Bishop David Zubik making the move in line with suggestions from people in his diocese. The personal parish will be located at St. Benedict the Moor Church. He was a 16th century saint born to African slave parents. And please join us for a Currents News special program, Faith and America's Original Sin, an encore showing of the half-hour broadcast about racism and why many in the church call it America's Original Sin will air tonight right after this newscast. Latin America is the new epicenter for the pandemic. According to Johns Hopkins University, there are now more than 2 million confirmed cases of COVID-19 across Latin America. Brazil has the most cases, more than 1 million, followed by Peru, Chile, Mexico, and Colombia. The United States still leads globally with nearly 2.5 million cases. And while Brazil is the virus hotspot in Latin America, Mexico may not be far behind. The country recorded a higher COVID-19 death toll in 24 hours than Brazil for the second straight day. Honestly, this epidemic hasn't ended, he says. It's still going on every day. The ovens at this crematorium in Mexico are constantly firing, but they still can't keep up. Families who bring loved ones here have to wait hours for them to be cremated. It's a morbid illustration that Mexico's epidemic is far from over and the numbers back it up. This chart shows the daily trend of new cases of the coronavirus in Mexico. It's not hard to see that things are only getting worse. This crematorium worker says reopening the economy is dangerous, that it's still too early to go back to normal. But Mexico's president disagrees. He says we have to go back out little by little carefully to exercise our freedom. Mexico's economy is in dire straits and Lopez Obrador knows it. So he's backed a phased reopening plan that for most of the country started June 1st, sending hundreds of thousands back to work across different industries. And he has plenty of support. At Mexico City's massive Central de Abastos wholesale market, vendor Rodolfo Machoro's sales have dropped 70 percent since the outbreak began. We want everyone to go back to normal, he says. Months of quarantine, it's too much. It's a very common sentiment here and amongst the millions of Mexicans who've lost their jobs recently. If I don't go out to work, who will feed my family? That's why we have to come here. But the market itself reinforces the high cost of reopening. Officials say more than 600 people that work here have tested positive for the coronavirus since April. 30% of me wants to reopen and 70% doesn't, says this vendor. It's necessary, but people aren't being safe enough. Mexico's death toll has more than doubled in just the last three weeks. A model from MIT predicts it could pass 50,000 by early August. And back inside the crematorium, that death toll becomes real. Those that work here see it, he says. We know this is not over. 
The death toll in Mexico now stands at more than 22,500. There are more than 185,000 confirmed cases. Still to come on Currents News, for the good of all, that's the theme of the week. We'll tell you what makes this week so special for Catholics. Also ahead, it may be a time of social distancing, but this couple is getting closer than ever. We'll meet them coming up. Do you have a story idea or want to share a tip? Email us at newstips at desalesmedia.org or call our 24-hour number, 718-517-3122. We'll be right back. This is a special time for American Catholics. It's Religious Freedom Week. Miami Archbishop Thomas Wenske is the man in charge of the Religious Liberty Committee for the U.S. Bishops Conference. He and his brother bishops are choosing as the Freedom Week theme for the good of all. Archbishop Wenske saying religious liberty is under threat throughout the world and he's urging Catholics to pray for religious freedom at home the and abroad. And finally tonight, couples are preparing for date night as restaurants open up around the country. Over in Minnesota, a couple with Down syndrome's first night on the town since restrictions lifted ended with a happy surprise. Frank Vassalero has that story. I was not expecting it at all. <laughs> Hi! For the first time in months, it was supposed to be a date night out on the town. I was like crying in front in the car and out of the car. And then... <laughs> There was rose petals inside. But when Maggie Erickson pulled up to St. Paul's Neighborhood Cafe on Friday, she knew this was different. I always wanted to, to happen at my uh, workplace. Aiden Kilgannon has worked there for three years. The couple with Down syndrome met seven months ago. I thought that she was the one. Oh, God. Aiden told us he'd been planning every last detail since. He just went down on the one knee and asked me. Pretty special. But perhaps the moment meant even more to Maggie's mom. Kathy raised her as a single mother and refused to set limits on what she could do. In our case, Maggie's developed substantial independence. Now, in her final stages of her own fight against stage 4 pancreatic cancer, Kathy couldn't be more proud of the young woman she raised. I just couldn't imagine not being here because I enjoy our life so much. A fever has put Kathy back in the hospital for now. Her vow? Do all she can to be there the day her determined daughter Follow your dreams and keep shining with your voice. takes her walk down the aisle. I know she's ready and I just have to make sure I'm ready. Congratulations to the young couple. That was Frank Vassalero reporting. The two have already started building their lives together. They even bought a house. And that is Currents News. Please stay right here. Our special program, Faith and America's Original Sin, airs next on Net TV. Also, a reminder that next week we are going to be on hiatus ahead of the 4th of July holiday. Net TV is preparing an outstanding lineup of programs that will air while we're away. You can find the schedule at netny.tv. I'm Christine Persichetti. Thank you for joining us because we are putting your faith in the news. Hope to see you again next time.